Hello and welcome to the Random Thought Show. My name's Jacob Tober. And my name's Darren McInnes. On the show, we talk about anything and everything in fitness, high performance, and health. Hey everyone, it's Jacob here with an Iron Edge Pro Tip before we kick off this episode. In this one, we're going to talk a lot about corrective exercise, whether it has any benefit, whether it's overdone or underused, and it's placed in strength and conditioning and fitness in general. One exercise that's definitely not a corrective and definitely is one of those exercises that you want to do hard and aggressively to get a good sweat on is battle ropes. Battle ropes are a great way to do your conditioning work, particularly if you've got a lower leg injury or you can't get extra running in, and it's good for that sort of general physical preparation, if you will. That doesn't mean, though, that you can just hammer them out with poor form. You still want to make sure you're getting a good posture, good alignment, so you can get the most benefit out of the exercise with the least risk. So take a hip width or a shoulder width stance. You want to be soft knees, sitting back in your hips when you're in your stance. And then when you're doing the ropes, make sure you're doing it from the arm. So the movement should be an arm-based thing, not a heaving, flexing, extending movement through the spine. So something along these lines, we like the alternating rapid arm variation where it's left, right, left, right, left, right, as quick as you can. Make sure the movement's coming from your arms, core engaged, back straight, sitting down into your hips. That's really the key with your battle ropes, so you can get the most out of it with the least amount of risk. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Random Thought Show. Hi guys, how are you going? Juicy one today. Yes. Very juicy. I spent the entire morning before we started recording <laughs> sitting in bed with horrible posture, which is topical, <laughs> reading articles that made me very mad. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I've been sitting on this for a few months. Uh, you brought it up a few times, but I, it was my bad. I hadn't done the adequate research to be on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. So a few months ago, um, I came across a bit of an internet fight on, on Facebook. As you see quite often. Yeah, and uh, and I stay out of those because I, I just I, they seem like such black holes of uh, of bad energy and a time sink, and they're just not. I like, think they're a large reason why the GDP of most countries isn't going up <laughs> yeah. as fast as a lot of people would like it to be. <laughs> it's like that Tim Minchin uh, quote, um, the awesome um, commencement speech he does. He talks about uh, yeah, fantastic stuff. Can you? Last episode, I failed on the show notes. Can you start writing a few little notes just down yes. the bottom? Like just write okay. Tim Minchin. That's all I'll need. Yeah. Um, so that uh, I've got the show notes for people in the track. Because we get an hour into these episodes and I've forgotten everything and days get busy. I don't have time to go through the entire episode to, yeah. to remember Tim every Minchin. note. Thank you. Um, we'll link to his. Uh, I, I think it's a top five commencement speech in, of all time. I think it's my favourite. I haven't done all the commencement speeches, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but it's my favourite of the ones I have. Yeah, I like it a lot. And he talks about how um, the loss of nuance in modern society mm-hmm. and how most people in arguments, it's the equivalent of um, two people playing tennis against each other on separate courts. Yeah. And uh, and I think that there's, there's a fair bit of this going on. Um, and but, then there's his quote about arseholes. And yeah. And opinions are like arseholes. Everyone has one, but it doesn't mean we want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I think it's, it was more like they should be taken out and thoroughly inspected was his quote. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Unlike ourselves, opinions should be thoroughly inspected regularly. <laughs> that's right. Um, it's, it's, it's really worth a listen. And I think it, it might have been one of those things where you stop what you're doing, go listen to that now and come back. Maybe not, maybe not in your, if you're in the car, it is a YouTube video. So, yeah, so if you're in the car, on the road. Yeah, but I think it, it's a nice companion piece, isn't it? Definitely yeah. worth going back for, yep. Uh, so anyway, so there was this internet fight and what it was was a, a person in our industry had said, um, I'm tired of this, uh, I can't believe that in blah, 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 we're still seeing this ass gravy served up about um, Dan John, who's one of the kind of uh, crazy uncles of strength and conditioning. Fantastic, brilliant thinker, great, brilliant great thinker, coach. Yeah. innovative thinker and, and a great guy uh, who we've been lucky enough to get to know a bit when he was, he was out here. Um, I don't agree with everything he says and does. Um, and I'm sure he doesn't agree with everything we say and do. Yeah. That's kind of the nature um, of all professions, I think. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to denigrate something that, like, let's call it ass gravy is just – and I just like, ooh, it got so it got my, you know, clickbait. It got my interest. Mm. Um, and what it was was he'd put up a slide of – uh, a, yon- a yonder slide of locked long and locked short. It wasn't specifically mentioning yonder though. He just it was said just a picture. It was it? just a picture of someone with poor, poor posture and good posture. So yeah. slouch shoulders, and we'll talk about poor and bad later. Yeah, we'll get into that. It was someone with slouch posture versus a neutral upright posture, mm. and he said you need as you as we age beyond any age, basically, you need to stretch what's tight and you need to strengthen what's weak. 
you know, referring to you know do more pulling than pushing effectively is, yeah. is the subject. But he never actually mentioned no, Giannis he specifically. Did, he, he didn't, yeah. And uh, and some people came down on him like a ton of bricks because there's no science that proves that what you said. And we'll, we'll dive into that. In, people with too much time on their hands. Too much time and, and yeah, too much religious fervor for science. Mm. But we'll get we'll get deep into that soon. But what was interesting to me is that as soon as I saw that, I thought to myself, well, well there's your error straight off the bat, which is that. If I disagree with someone, I actually will typically ask them why they think that way. I will drill into it because maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'll learn something. And also, if you've if you've insulted someone's thinking and work, you've now literally cemented yourself in to trench warfare. You've 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 poured the cement around your feet, and you now have no intellectual agility. You can't change your position. Because what are you going to do, come around and say, oh, you know that thing? Like, I, I, <laughs> five, five comments later, you're not going to go, you know how I said that was ass gravy? I was wrong. Turns out I like ass gravy. No <laughs> one's saying that. <laughs> and, you know, like there, there was a thing, um, we did an episode a while ago about exercises that we don't like, right? Quite a while ago. Quite a while ago. Yeah. And I'd like to do a reboot of that because we've changed our mind on a couple of things. Um, one of them that Pat mentioned is uh, we were negative on skipping and I think uh, we were wrong. We would, yeah. We should um, do a skipping episode as well. But we didn't say only idiots give out skipping. I th- so you know, yeah. So there's we a, left room for move. So there's this whole thing about oh, and I saw this on a different, a separate Instagram thing the other day. There was, uh, it's not, it's never the exercise's fault. It's just how you're doing the exercise. So every mm. exercise is great. It's just how you execute mm. it, whether you're strong enough or have mm. the requisite or mobility. It's appropriate or for you and so forth. Yeah. I think for 99, 98% of exercises, that's true. Mm. There is a case for nearly every exercise. Yeah. But I also think there are four, five, maybe ten stupid things that you shouldn't do for your body. Shouldn't do. That the human body in its upright posture and its bipedal pelvic rib alignment state. And its poor adaptation to its upright posture. Which was a great thing one of those articles I read this yeah. morning was talking about like most of our body, like we talked about last episode, mm. is old. We yeah. still have a lot of the setup for being quadruped. We've got the same setup for being a cat. Yeah. Basically in terms of our spine. Not quite the same a vertical. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, particularly a dog with a nuchal ligament as well, yeah. more so than a cat. Yeah. Um, but there are still, I think, a handful of exercises mm. that – burpees, great example. Mm. You just – there's no yeah. way to and, do that. And let's save it. Save that for another time. <laughs> but there's no way to do that that's – Good and safe for the human body. So. Oh, and necessary for most mm. people, yeah. Um, Another time on that. Let's no, get back yeah, on track yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of it's you getting off track. <laughs> so I think the, the first thing to talk about there is, yeah, like, it just, it's such a, um, a sort of checkers, not chess move to attack other people's thinking because you can't learn from them. You've just shut yourself down. You've cemented yourself in and... Now, you can't learn. You can't have an effective conversation or debate. No. It's just like well, that person is going to, I'm just going to ignore it. Well, you can have a debate because I think you can have like a legalistic style debate where you just prosecute your case. Yeah, but it's but tennis it's not, on separate courts. It's, it's not mm. good. Um, and so that was interesting in itself. But it did open up to me a really interesting thing, which is that there's a big, there's a big divide, I think, in, in strength and conditioning and in, in fitness, and that's between – the extreme correctionists that think that you just have to, oh, you're breathing wrong, uh, you need to stretch this perfectly, you need to do this do this fiddly exercise, and it's like 45 minutes later you can start training. Yeah. Well you, and then you've only got two minutes and you're not allowed to do anything heavy because you might break. Yeah, or you might, you know, your shoulders might round or whatever it might be, yeah. The yeah. super correctionist approach. Which, and, and, you know, I think part of the correctionist approach is, is validating the need for the corrector so it's it's that thing of well you need to do this because you'd be you'd be messed up if you didn't train with us. There's a T-shirt you can buy that says uh, "Strength Coaches Finding Problems You Didn't Know You Had Since <laughs> 1999." <laughs> it's like yeah, sometimes yeah. you're doing that. It's like and, and, I didn't know my dorsiflexion was a problem. And so so yeah, there's there's a case against if all you do is correction, you're actually not a coach. I don't know what you are, but you're kind correctionist. of correctionist. You're a correctionist. Um, and so the case was made against. That. And I think, yeah, what you end up with if you take it too far is lots of fiddly stuff. You don't really get any proper training done. Um, and you can – the big thing, I think, the biggest harmful thing is you can feed – you can fuel nocebo, which is the opposite of placebo. You're more across, I think. Oh, the, I was going to say you are. Maybe I am. I'm more a placebo guy than a nocebo guy. <laughs> so the, you yeah, go. Okay, so, so the whole thing is how suggestible humans are. Should we talk uh, – can I touch on placebo first and then you can yeah, round it out? Yeah, yeah. okay. So we did a, a vlog about placebo a little mm. while. So placebo is the idea of 
if I tell you something is going to be good for you as a person of authority, potentially, mm. if you if you perceive me that way, if I say, Durham, these this glass of water, I put some powder in it, it's going to make you grow taller. It, it like it short circuits your growth hormone, it gets your bones going again, it'll work. If you probably won't, but if yeah. you believe me enough, and this is a poor example because mm. you can't grow taller. Maybe a better example would be is I've put some tasteless caffeine in your mm. water. Yeah, good good example. Yeah. yeah, so I put some tasteless caffeine in your water. And you won't know it's there, but you're going to feel great. You're going to feel amazing, alert, yeah. energized, focused. Because I've told you that, you will indeed mm. feel – it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it's, where, it's been done with not non-caffeinated coffee. I think that's actually, that's actually a study. <laughs> yeah, and – well, for me, it'd be the taste, like just tasting yeah. coffee is enough to get me. Mm. Oh, yeah, I've mm. had my coffee, morning started mm. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and so you can get that fake effect mm. because you perceive you expect it to be there. And and Seth Godin, I'm, I'm making a little note on, on that as well. Seth Godin, uh, he's written a wonderful article and a great podcast about placebo and, and why we should be building placebo. It's not an either or. It's not you just do medically effective stuff. It's you um, kind of market and present your effective medical stuff with also a dose of placebo because you know that's that's going to be yeah. uh, helpful to it. Don't hurt my placebos. I love my placebos. You know, yeah, it's really <laughs> I want them. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're great. And and just and there's Craig Harper gave a great example a while ago that I was listening to about uh, someone who'd also been given a similar thing where they did a pretend scan that he had. Was, this guy was covered in in these weird warts that wouldn't go away, and the doctors kind of did a trick pretend like they made him think he'd been had some rays put on him. And like, it's ultra such and such, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and they, and they, they placeboed the hell out of it and, and the things just died and fell off. Like his nervous system just was like, ah, deal with I've this. had the treatment. But yeah. it was not actually treatment. Yeah. It was just a solarium. And so, and so placebo is a, a wonderful, powerful thing that can be used to help people be better. So and people use it for fake back surgery. Yeah. People go in, they go, all right, surgery, mm. they put them on an anesthetic mm. and then they do a couple of injections it's, and it's, that's it. It's all so interesting. Yeah, and, and it's increasingly recognised that it's legitimate. It's not... Uh, I think placebo used to be just a like witch doctory thing. It's not at all. Um, and placebo's opposite is nocebo, which is where you are told that uh, you're weak or fundamentally broken in some way, and that this is a really serious problem, and your pain uh, gets worse. Mm. And this happens all. And, and it used to happen a lot with scans. Yeah. People would, would get a scan. The dreaded MRI. Yeah, and the scan would tell them they had dysfunction or, you know, like a disc or issue. degeneration. Or, yep. like, yeah, but everyone does. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, And they would see that, freak out, and actually it would magnify their pain. And some people really sadly were um, unnecessarily in pain for literally decades mm. because of being fueled nocebo by, um, by practitioners that didn't understand how it worked because pain science is such a new Science, it's such a new thing that we just did not understand how all that stuff works. Another top 10 video to go watch on YouTube when you're done is Lauren yeah. Mosley's amazing and hilarious TEDx talk at Adelaide from oh, ages ago. Yeah. But he just breaks down pain and the idea of pain being an output from the brain, not an input from the environment, as a really important concept. It's like, mm. you know, yes, there might be damage, you might be burning, you might mm. have a snake bite in the example mm. he uses, but that doesn't mean that is the cause of the pain. Your brain isn't going, oh, yeah. I saw the snake, I saw the bite, mm. therefore I'll freak out and don't, panic. Don't steal the show. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. So there's definitely been significant harm done to people through the over through the correctionalist ob- obsession. Yeah. Your, uh, your disc is herniated, you'll never bend over again. Yeah, and that fear avoidance. Mm. Um, and we see time and time again that if you can break down the fear avoidance, get people moving, get people loading tissues in a positive way, work around acute problems, you can actually get amazing results. So there's definitely a problem with that. Um, but what we've ended up with is in typical human fashion. Uh, typical scientific from, fashion, yeah. yeah from, a, from a certain uh, uh, pretty large segment of, um, of the industry, there's been a – on overcorrection back the other direction. So the overcorrection is it's like there's no such thing as pain. It's just push through anything. All load is good. Yep. Um, Every exercise is fine. Just do all just, the exercises. It doesn't matter whether it's a, a core exercise or a movement. Just move. That's the only thing the body needs. Yeah. And and fueling and bolstering that sort of um, that fervor is this – religious level insistence on if something is not evidence-based, if there's not been a study, then that thing does not exist. Yep. Uh, and it's just it's just bullshit. 
complete. Like, yeah. so there are things, it, it, again, I've talked about this before, but we'll talk about it again. Imagine you have a gigantic wall. That wall is obscured in darkness. You now shine a spotlight on a one-metre section of that wall, and you can now see everything on that wall. That's science. Doctor, another mm-hmm. reference for you to put down another video for everyone to go watch. This, this one's going to have more references than it does content, this podcast. Mm. Uh, Stuart Feierstein, I believe is his name, something along those yep. lines. He talks about it's, it's science is you're in a black room with a spotlight, looking around the room, trying to find a black cat that may or may not exist. Yeah. <laughs> and so you're looking and you can only point the spotlight in a certain point at a certain point. The further back you stand, so the more broad your science, the weaker you'll see the details. Yeah. The closer in, the narrower, but the more specific you can see. In the things, less context. In the less context. And yeah. so if you're, you're looking for a cat that may or may not exist and may or may or not be moving. so And, and we love science. Like, I love it. We, Strong. we yeah. named the positioning for the business core advantage the science of superior performance. Like we're into it. Um, we make some science here in collaboration with Deakin. I serve on the advisory board to the exercise and sports science. School. We're fully into science. Yeah. Um, but if you're just shackled by never doing anything unless it's evidence-based, uh, it's crazy because we just haven't uncovered everything. And we, and we will not because some things don't yield themselves to a double-blind study. Not Something- the, the gold standard, the, the double-blind study where you get two groups and then from there you move them forward mm-hmm. with the intervention. One group has the intervention, one group doesn't. You see what the difference is. Some things you just can't do that, whether it be like just like diet. It's really hard to get people to yeah. adhere to that kind of thing. Yeah. It's expensive to lock people into rooms for weeks at a time mm. and, and observe them. It's hard to crunch the numbers. And some things just like on too long of a long, the time span to be yeah. able to see the actual impact. And some things also you can't double blind it because, you know, if, we, if we're doing a group that's doing foam rolling and not doing foam rolling, you know, mm. like, they're going to know they're not doing it as well. And, and so there's all sorts of areas where you just can't, yeah. Um, and so because of that, there's this view that if something's not proven, it's rubbish and, uh, and, 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 and we shouldn't be doing it. And that, gave, and that, that gives rise to this idea that, um, and that was one of the things that fired you up, was the, the uh, personal philosophy. Thing. Yeah, it's like um, your pers- if your personal philosophy isn't grounded in science, then your personal philosophy should be changed and it's irrelevant. It's like, well, maybe, but if that person's got 30 years of experience working at elite sport, has a doctorate, has done research, Mm. Seeing the industry from multiple different angles, I'm going to listen to that person. Yeah, whether they've got a paper, whether they've got a reference little number down the bottom of their slide or not, I'm going to listen to that person if I'm working in a similar context. Yeah, like they, they will have picked some things up, <laughs> you know, because because the bad people get get weirded out. Mm. Um, they will, as that same person then mentioned in the things like not many people survive in high performance without developing beliefs and developing yeah. their own theories and their own working practices. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, it was it was fascinating. Uh, so the the overreaction um, is really interesting because I think it is uh, arguably more harmful than the thing it is overreacting to. Mm. Because one hundred percent. Because you've got um, well, I'm I'm I've kind of jotted down some of the thoughts. We've got on some notes here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so where we've ended up with is this idea that. And so uh, we, we should also fill in the context here. Mm. So on one side of the picture is the just, you know, the corrective. Everything has to be a corrective and you have to be posture and alignment. You can't start lifting for a year. You've got to get everything perfect. All this foundational stuff and, yeah. and the very stuff that makes a lot of athletes roll their eyes. Oh, and, yeah. and a lot of coaches and a lot of civilians roll their eyes when they yeah. have, to say, oh, I have to do 20, 30 minutes of work. It's like, there's, there's that sort of things. And the other sort of things is just make them sweat. Just shut, just, up. Sh- shut up and lift. Shut up and train. Whatever I don't care like, that it hurts. Let's just go. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're kind of the two – Polar opposites, if you will, and but, they're ones that, you know. And there's some extremists on the shut up and lift camp that are like, form doesn't even really matter. You've all got a unique postural signature. You should just do your thing. Just go with it, yeah. Which is, you know, which is really interesting. Uh, and so where you end up with is when you take the evidence based thing too far. When you when you when you convert science and enlightened discussion into dogma, where you end up with is define dogma quickly. No. So, oh, let's put it on the spot. Uh, so dogma is where you dogmatically adhere to a belief no matter what is going on. So so there can be, you know, religious dogma where it's just you follow the, the sort of precepts of religion irrespective of what the actual um, true intent might be behind it, I suppose. Blind like, aggressive faith Yeah, is kind of how I'd sort of think of it. Yeah. So it's your... Um, you're, I don't think either of us have defined that very well. It's we strongly will. linked to traditions. Like we yeah. do this because we've always done it. That's just the way things are. Mm. Yeah. Without yeah. actually going, okay, either logically or scientifically going, is yeah. that actually appropriate? Yeah. And so that's that the, the deep irony 
um, that the people most in, in these situations who are like super all about the science are actually having so much more in common with religion, which is, you know, kind of the opposite of science. In so many ways. Um, but yeah, what you end up with is you end up with this idea that um, there's no evidence that bad posture causes pain. And there isn't particularly good evidence around that because I've had trouble establishing that. And maybe it, maybe it doesn't cause um, pain, pain directly. or directly, um, but it's it's part of a suboptimal system. If you're really slumped, we can't load you very well. Uh, you can't move well. You don't have you know that natural athleticism. And a lot of the research, because I've read this all this mm. morning, it's all very fresh. A lot of the evidence looks at it in terms of we get these people who do have back pain these people who don't have back pain, mm. and then compare their anatomies. Mm. So in the presence of pain, do the people who have lower back pain, do they have more anterior tilt, more lordosis, yeah. more tightness in the hip flexor, whatever it might be. But what that doesn't count for is the fact that you can have tightness, and if you've developed the appropriate workaround strategy for that tightness or postural mm. thing, you can go your whole life without developing pain. It's not like you're guaranteed pain by being in a, fun- mm. in a funky position or in a mm. wonky position. Mm. It just increases your chances Potentially. So we need to get bigger samples, like groups of 63 people. That's not much of a study. Mm. We need For this sort of a thing, we need hundreds and hundreds of and people. And no one's ever going to do it. That's just really tricky. It's really tricky and it's um, it's laborious and, and no one's, no one's going to get into it. And for these people who are so scientifically rigorous, technically you need to get two groups of completely healthy people, tell yeah. one of them to stand in an anterior tilt, yeah. tell, tell them that is safe, Tell the other group to stand normally in normal posture, go and forward then, 12 months and then see then, whether the group then, that was told about then, anterior tilt is in fact... That would be that would be legit, but it's just never going to happen. But those people who are told to stand in anterior pelvic tilt after because they're humans, after two weeks they're going to feel this hurts a lot, I'm really stiff and sore. <laughs> yeah. They're going to just naturally go back to standing normally and walking and moving in a normal pattern. So and then they're going to come back and they're going to lie. You'd, you'd have to lock them into it. You'd have to have a machine. Some form of them. brace or have them in a room <laughs> yeah. that buzzes them every time they get out of their anterior yeah. tilt. You'd re-rig one of those postural things to go the reverse. But yeah. I think if you did that, if you did that study, you would find those people that would pre the study were completely healthy, mm. those people that were told about anterior tilt and told to stand in the anterior tilt would have a sore lower back. Because it, you know, it's it's physics, it's functional anatomy. If you're jamming certain structures up into like if you're jamming to an extreme so an anterior tilt is where you've got an extreme duck like position. So rather than the butt butt's, poked, butt's out. poked out heaps. Um, subtle degrees of that doesn't matter. Everyone and everyone, everyone lives in a subtle well, degree of yeah, anterior tilt. It's, it's meant to be there. Uh, but if you jam someone right up into that, yeah, that's not going to be great. Um, so we've ended up in this strange place where there's no evidence that bad posture anywhere in the body is a problem. Uh, and also, also they say. So that, that's what they're saying. Yeah. This is, so this is the position they've, they've, they've landed on. Uh, you can't fix posture with training. So rows can't fix scapular posture. Hip flexor Don't even bother. Doesn't help. Uh, uh, lordosis is irrelevant. We proved it by investigating a study of Turkish coal miners. Yeah. A perfect sample. Yeah. Very related <laughs> to our, our Western world desk worker. <laughs> Um, and yeah, like you can't change, basically there's no point fixing stuff and you can't fix stuff anyway. Um, uh, trigger points don't exist. So when you're foam rolling, that pain you feel when you're foam rolling, there's no science that proves that's a thing. So it doesn't exist. It's in your mind. In your- <laughs> well, that's part of the thing is they think trigger points might be neural. That's another whole, that's a whole other theory. thing. But, um, but yeah, they, they go to that extreme position where it's like, there's no science to prove trigger points exist. Yeah. And so they say they don't exist. And then we go and poke them in the trap and it hurts and they go, our, oh, just disproved your own theory. Like how does that uh, how, just yeah. logically and, and circles? And, and so it's like you shouldn't bother stretching the hip flexors because that doesn't help. And if you're a competitive, if you're training competing athletes to me, yeah, hell yeah, don't stretch their hip flexors. I'm all for that because your guys are going to suck and my guys are going to run fast. When you say competing as in competing against our team, yeah, our, our athletes. Yeah, I, I would love the rest of the world to never stretch hip flexors. Like, yeah. <laughs> if they're competing against Everyone who's people. not playing for Australia or Victoria, yeah. stop stretching. Because, <laughs> you know, we've seen profound, almost instantaneous results where you loosen off a hip flexor. It's like the handbrake in the car, people run faster, jump higher, move better. Like, Which comes back to the idea of like of that anecdotes are useless. It's like, Darren, you've been doing this, what, since 99? 99, yeah. 20 years, mm. you've improved a significant amount of athletes' vertical leap. Yeah. It seems to me that that's a pretty good body of evidence just because it's not published and you're too busy doing the hip flexor stretching doesn't mean that's not good and, evidence. And not that that's the only thing. We're, we're, There's you know, lots of stuff, yeah. You know, but, yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating. So, um, yeah, they're also saying that um, – and a valid thing they say in, in many respects is that models don't work very well because everyone is so different. And, mm. and I will pay that to a certain extent. Yeah. Like all of this stuff, 
is definitely worth debating, mm. definitely worth discussing. It's just the absolutist positions they take on this stuff. It's like there's no evidence to prove it. Lordosis means nothing. It's like, no, mm. maybe it's just been a little overhyped. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and um, they also make the case that because models, and it's one of the things we you take, we talk about models, we talk about like a framework for looking at things like a thank you, yeah, like the FMS for example is a model of injury prediction. Yeah, you yeah. do these seven tests, it give you this score. That score is mm. then a model for risk assessment. And you know, like we tried the FMS and we ended up deciding that it wasn't for us. Um, we thought it was working too much on extrapolation, like it would extrapolate you had bad dorsi by looking at your squat, for yeah. instance. And we decided we would actually rather just measure what the dorsiflexion was by centimetres near the wall because you get the exact data. And sort of joint by joint, a little more isolated. Yeah, yeah. Um, and our our screen has tremendous value and we can, we can find – because it used to be in the old days I would get – I'd get like six weeks in with someone or, or ten weeks in and then – we'd discover something limiting them. Like, oh, if I'd known about that limitation on day one, we could have started that day one and this wouldn't even be a problem right now. Um, uh, there's that critical path idea. Have we talked about critical path and the Gantt chart idea? No, we haven't. Mm. Look, yeah. So imagine you're building a house and uh, you have a Gantt chart, which is any, any major project is going to have a Gantt chart, and that is the series of different things that have to be done for that project to be completed. Yeah, it's like uh, all your projects are on a timeline and – some things can't start before things before them in the Gantt chart. So it's like a something. It's called is it the same as a waterfall chart? I think it's similar, loosely yeah. connected. Yeah. So it's the idea that you know one at one task takes three months, then the next takes two months, so, and they kind of trickle on. And up so you're other. building a house. Um, the first thing that has to be done is you've got to do the foundations. If you don't do the foundations, you can't do anything else. And so that's the thing that's called on the critical path because it's going to block every other project yeah so without foundations, you can't do walls, you can't do a roof, you can't do carpet, you can't do plumbing. All that stuff is. Mm. blocked by this critical path thing, which is the foundation. Whereas there are other things that you can do simultaneously or you can do them slightly out of order. It's not the end of the world. Yeah, so once the foundation is done, you can be doing the walls and while you're doing the walls, you can also start doing the insulation on the walls that are already done. You might be able to do the windows before you do the doors. Yeah. These other things can be done. Uh, But what I found was that a lot of critical path things I was missing because we weren't getting analysis in early. Weren't properly assessing. And so now we're stuck at week six with a mobility problem that we could have been six weeks into fixing and it was slowing everything down. Um, and you know, our job is to make people get better as fast as – like we want to make people as strong and explosive as possible, as fast as is possible. So we screen at the start and we find out what we're dealing with and then we correct the correctable. But we don't obsess. It's not like we're, not like we're not starting training until week 10. And so on the idea of critical path things, dorsiflexion isn't a critical path to strength training. Mm. It's not like – well, we have to do 10 weeks of dorsiflexion stretching until we can start because our strength training. Because we can put a heel wedge under you and or, we can give you fake dorsi. Or we can do a hip thrust. We yeah. can do exercise that doesn't require dorsiflexion yeah. and train other muscles and we other movement other patterns. Uh, but some things are critical path. Um, so, for instance, uh, thoracic mobility, if you have a really slumpy, locked up thoracic, you get to a certain point with the weights where it really means this it becomes like a squat becomes just a thoracic Melting candle, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and that's that's the limiting factor. But anyway, and, and at that point, it becomes dangerous to continue progressing the load without fixing mm. or assessing or, or modifying that restriction. And you might have someone that's then stuck on an eighty kilo squat that you should have had to a hundred and ten kilo squat because their little lack of thoracic integrity was was really slowing down the whole process. And you could have started that on, on day one with some some. Cat camels and some back balls and some and some windmill types. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So had you assessed that early, you would have known it and go, mm. okay, this is going to be a critical path problem soon. So yeah. we better start some let's, homework. Let's, let's start some intervention now. And the workout's not going to be full of thoracic mobility no. work. Five minutes, five, two exercises. Two, not even five minutes. Three no. minutes, two exercises, ninety I mean, seconds. This is the each. thing they all lose sight of. It's a tiny bit, and it's a, like if you were to say to that person, "Oh, you've got a terrible thoracic. This is going to cause you tremendous pain." Oh, oh, you'll 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 never, be, you'll never you know, be able you'll never drive a car. And <laughs> that'd be bad because you might nocebo them. Yep. But if you just say, "Hey, this is an issue. We're going to sort this out." And there are also those coaches, those correctionist coaches we mentioned before, mm. that will just do a oh. program built around thoracics. And, and that, it's like, thirty minutes, and the athlete you can just see the athlete just like struggling for, painfully. For God's sake, it. can I just? And it's just like it's just broccoli with broccoli on top with some more broccoli. Yeah, <laughs> you know, nothing, nothing exciting, nothing good. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so. The other, they've also come at, you know, stretching is a waste of time um, because, it, again, the evidence basis on stretching is still um, mixed at best. It's actually quite good in the long term. It's just that it's acutely bad, which is a funny thing because yeah. if you even zoom out on that one, that's a whole other thing. 
Um, well, I think we've talked about stretching. Can you write a note there, Darren, that I'll, uh, I'll add that show note to the podcast episode? This is going to be the most densely cross-referenced. I've written strength. Stretching. Stretching, yeah, stretching yeah. podcast, yep. We did an episode talking about deconstructing the whole. Cause the, yeah, because of Luke Gerke. Because yeah. acutely uh, stretching isn't good in terms of power if you stretch the wrong muscles. Yeah, exactly. if you stretch the right, it's the whole thing. Just listen worth that listening on. Yeah. Moving on. Uh, and so where we end up with, I think, is a real missed opportunity to actually make people better. And what we end up, what we have is uh, this: people, people will go and do exercise, and they will not be given any any correction whatsoever because it's like, oh, however you move is just how you are. Load it. They're going to get a lot of bad results. People are going to get sore. It's going to magnify their dysfunction. Uh, we're going to see that people are actually worse than it's like because the classic, the worst thing we can do as coaches, as personal trainers, is you take someone and you permanently damage them in the process of trying to help them. Yeah, that uh, the first golden rule of training, do no harm. Yeah. If you yeah. violate that, if you break your athlete in the gym trying to make them a better volleyball player, better footballer, yeah. what was the point of the gym? Yeah, exactly. Um, and there's just so much of that. And I, I think I, I think also it's actually pretty lazy because it's like, oh, you can't do it, there's no point. Just, just shut up and lift heavy. That, that's not a particularly, um, I don't know, it's, the, it's just too easy mm. and you don't actually get great results with it. This whole thing comes down to this, this obsession and need for black and white. Mm. Everything has to be in a camp. You have mm. to be an Olympic lifting guy or a plyometrics guy. You've got to be a corrective person or a shut up and sweat person. It's like, well, no, there is a time and a place for pretty much everything in the gym. Yeah. There is a time for some correctives. There is a time for cardio. There is mm. a time for metabolic work. There is a time for shut up and train. There is a time for going heavy. Mm. You just need to like use some nuance, practice yeah. some subtlety, and apply the appropriate doses, the appropriate stimulus based on individual context. And it's that it, you, you're spot on. It's that camp, like it's that that ideological trench warfare. Where I'm over here in the this camp and you're in the that camp, and not only do I not agree with you about this particular thing, but I also disagree with you about these other things that my camp all believes. So you, can, you don't even get to pick your own beliefs. You're like it's like you choose your camp. We're in this camp, and we and believe the, these things as well. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So you don't even get to pick and mix, and it just seems crazy because, and so you know, one of the people that gets uh, attacked a lot, who's perceived as being on the correctionist side, of it, is Mike Boyle, uh, and you know he's brilliant. I disagree. Like he's one of the biggest influences in my life, and one day I, I hope to go meet him because you know he's been been a tremendous influence. Uh, but I don't agree with everything he does, and I'm sure he would come here and not agree with everything. But I I like the freedom of I can pick a thing that he likes, and I can I can with my own judgment, philosophy, and knowledge go. Yeah, I, I like that. I'm going to use that. Oh, and, and there's other things I go. Yeah, I'm not I'm not so big on that for these reasons. I'm going to go this way. That, that flexibility to build your own philosophy, whereas it's like these guys just, um, they just have to, they're like soccer hooligans. Mm. Soccer hooligans mixed with religious fervor. It's a weird combo. Mm. When they're, and the whole time they're preaching this scientific rigor. And yeah. it's like, and people listen you, to it. You, you're so close to this. You're so up in the face of it. You just can't see the elephant for the wrinkly skin, for the trunk. <laughs> That's, yeah. That story about the blind, the five blind, me. Five, five blind men uh, st- standing up to an elephant. One person touches the trunk and goes, ah, oh, it's a snake. Another person grabs the leg and goes, ah, oh, it's a tree. Another person touches and, and the whole thing is like, no, they're all just touching. They're just too close to the problem, too close yeah. to the elephant to be able to yeah. see the whole elephant. The whole elephant. Yeah. Um, and so it's like this. It's like they're so close saying science, science, science. They can't see. They're not being scientific mm. in their desperate need to be scientific. And just shouting everyone down. So... Yeah. Um, I also actually on, on that. It's, it's, it's I'm, re- I'm reading a book at the moment called The Art of Logic. I'm halfway ooh, okay. halfway through it. It's ooh, but it's a bit dry. It's written by a mathematician, and it's very oh, I don't like it already. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an, I think it's an important book. It's just a hard read. Yeah, because like it takes logic all the way down to the really bare boot, bare bare roots of mathematical mm. principles and logic. Mm. And what really the biggest takeaway for me so far through the book has been that logic and science and maths and science aren't actually the same thing. We often just lump them into one. The scientific method and the mathematical method are actually separate entities. Mm. And we're also busy going, oh, the scientific method, no study has proven that. But maths and logic actually work in a different stream, in a different universe with different rules, if you will. 
Mm. And so we actually need to be applying some scientific method and some scientific rigor, mm. but also we need to be applying logic and critical thinking. Yes. If A equals B, B doesn't necessarily equal A because yeah. it doesn't always work circularly, but in yeah. certain logical situations it will. And so understanding when that does and doesn't apply I think is super critical that we all miss. Mm. We're so busy being scientific that we forget about the logic Logical. side of things. And I've made my entire career built around the logic side. Like, I mean, I'm very interested in... As is Mike Boyle. Yeah, yeah, I'm very interested in the science and I've always been so. Um, but where science, but the, the application of the science, it has to be... Uh, the a, operating system has to be through a logical framework. Yeah, and yeah. so it's, you take your science, you apply logic to it, and then you execute as, mm. as appropriately. But there's no reason to say you can't take anecdotal evidence and apply brilliant logic to it, and then that becomes yeah. appropriate. Yeah, um, because uh, but it's that thing where anecdotal is just completely invalid. Like, no, it's 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 valid if you care about you know good practice. Yeah. Uh, so, in pushing back against that, I think it's a, it's it's as always it's that middle ground, isn't it? Where it's, yeah. it's let's, shades of grey. Yeah, let's make sure we are doing some work uh, to correct things, but let's not be obsessed when they don't get perfect. Um, because you know, you I think when you when you do first get on the correctionalist bandwagon, a lot of people think you're going to fix everything. So yeah, some people's posture's not going to improve that much at all, and you just have to deal with that and work and work around that. And some they're going to get great improvements, uh, for example. And sometimes the problems are so little that it's like, well, that'll probably just work itself out in the wash. I'm not going to mm. stress on that little bit of asymmetry, that one or two centimeter asymmetry, or that little bit of less than optimal we've got there. That's not the end of the world. So we don't want to get just Mm. caught up about that we can just go okay you know, mm. see how that plays out we'll keep an eye on it yep. but we're not going to spend half an hour of work out covering that yep. although um you just reminded me of something else i wanted to talk about which was that uh there is a sports thing and it, it happens a little bit in track and field and and it's this thing where um you know there'll be a bit of a problem and uh coaches will be like ah they'll just run it out as though just the act of running or jumping will just kind of iron out the kinks biomechanically. Magically solve that problem. Yeah. Um, there was a and shout out to the Daily Talk Show. Um, uh, Josh Jansen on the show was once told by an osteo that because he uh, had some scapular issues uh, and he was told that he should just do speedball punching oh. because that was just going to, that, that repetitive overhead striking the ball uh, was going to sort out his scapular issues. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> uh, so, the, so the, you know, you're not going to just wash stuff out with just activity. You do have to have some. No, you know, and so I do like the theory that, you know, getting people in pain to move more is just going to be the 80-20 of it. Yeah. Definitely. But if you have a lower back problem, a scapular problem, you should probably do some specific exercises mm. for that dysfunction. If yeah. you have weak rhomboids, you should probably strengthen your rhomboids. Yeah. And yeah. in isolation, it's totally fine. And, um, I mean, the, one of the most profound examples ever was I had um, – this, this was a personal training client a uh, long, long time ago when I had a head full of hair, so that, that, uh, that takes you way back. And this woman – well, she would have been maybe, she was, uh, maybe 29 years old. Um, she had had constant headaches for a decade. And a friend of mine who was a, a remedial masseur had said – had been treating her for six months and he said, you know what, you need to go see Durham. I, I can keep treating you and I'll help a bit, but you need to fix the root cause of this and get your posture better. And she came along and I made her do – and so, she, so headaches multiple times per week for a decade. She came along and I made her do a reverse shrug on the lat pull-down machine, so engaging the lower traps in order to get the upper traps it's like to a rest. chin up without the elbows. Uh, and we've got, a, we've got a video on that as well, haven't we? We can link that. Blog post video, yep. Uh, video reverse shrug. Yeah, so straight um, arms, just depressing the scapula, engaging your lats, your lower traps, your rhomboids. Yep. And what that was doing was it was switching off. So her, her upper traps were chronically tight, a decade worth of stress and tightness, and they were fueling headache-based pain through her neck. Pulling on her occipital bone and, and through the yeah. neck, yep. Not, not uh, so we did that. We did three sets of 10, and that was on the Wednesday. And I saw her again the next Wednesday, and I said, how did you go afterwards? And I was a little worried that maybe I would have flared her headache up. Yep. And she said... I haven't had a headache for seven consecutive days. That That's never happened. Uh, and then we went on and she basically, apart from a hangover after a grand final day, she basically just didn't have um, headaches anymore ever. And so it was one of the things where, yeah, you can, you can make profound change with little targeted interventions 
And was it a strength? Strength as strength as therapy as a way of fixing people and helping and create. And we didn't just stop there. And yeah, you know, the, we built on that. There's a whole company called Movement as Medicine. Mm, yeah. But here's the thing with Movement as Medicine: just like other medicine, you should take the appropriate pill for the appropriate condition. Yeah. If you have diabetes, you probably need to be taking insulin. Oh, jeez. Hang. Hit sorry, the mic. Hit the mic, everyone. I'm so sorry. I got a bit excited. <laughs> um, if you have, I, I don't know. I don't know. Medicines and drugs, but if you have a problem that needs a certain drug, yeah. take that certain drug. Don't just take all the drugs. Yeah. It's the same with exercise. Apply the appropriate yeah. dose. Yeah. Take advantage of you know specific adaptation to imposed demands, yeah. mechanotransduction, all those fun scientific concepts that we spend so long in uni learning about. Mm. It doesn't mean that just because we do a couple of research papers that show, show correctives don't work, it just doesn't mean out. we just throw out reciprocal inhibition and well, all those factors. And I mean, you look at you look at the deep system activation approach that North Melbourne Football Club had. Uh, and during the, that idea, period, the idea of deeply activating your TVA, pelvic floor, multifidus so muscles. transverse abdominis, pelvic floor, multifidus. multifidus. Um, and they had the lowest soft tissue injury rate in the history of the AFL. Not a coincidence. They were, they were applying some really clever strategies to get their, their software great. Uh, we'll link, we've got a multifidus video as well. Yep. Um, because I think it's nice to talk about this, but it's good to ground it in some, um, some actual takeaways. And we... I was very cynical about multifidus when we first got talking to our friend yeah. Simon about it. I was like, really, can it make that big a difference? Um, and we, we had a kid with, um, with Sherman's disease where he had a wedge-shaped deformity of his lumbar spine. and it's Something that we're not going to be able to correct. <laughs> <laughs> not going to be able to correct that. And on, on palpation during the screening, uh, his lumbar spine was, it was like, like it was rock hard. Uh, I gave him multifidus exercise and a week later, Totally normal muscle tissue. It just switched off. It, it stopped its protective mechanism. It had been great. Um, so, yeah, there's so much you can do in terms of basic stuff. The three big rocks. So I think in terms of corrective stuff. Yeah. A good correct. Not overdoing it, not overcommitting to it, but just the big ones. If it's – it depends on the context. Mm. So – We had to be scattergun though. Right? Here's, what I, here's what I'd do. Go on. Um, Almost everyone has some level of being a bit too tight through their thoracic. I've yet to see a person who is like, your thoracic's too loose. Everyone is in some form a little bit slumpy. Cryphotically restricted. Because car, desk, movie, dinner table, couch, everything's just... Phones. Phone, everything, everything's everything's just front. locking us over a little bit. So a, a good corrective is just to do some cat camels. Yep. You know, or really. Some people call it happy cat, angry cat. Cat cows, it's got in, in a quadruped moves. position, just dropping and lifting, just just moving. Um, like that's a wonderful thirty second corrective that is of zero risk and wonderful benefit that everyone could do. Uh, if you did that and a little bit of deep system stuff like the multifidus, which we will have linked in the video, um, that and for most people, some form of a body weight squat. I reckon mm. if you just did those three things, yeah, because people will sort of put exercise into buckets. It's either a corrective or it's not a corrective exercise. It's like, mm. well, things are on a continuum of corrective Yeah. yeah. Um, and a body weight squat is both a warm-up for some people, a strength exercise for others, and a corrective for another group, yeah. subgroup of people. Um, but I, I think those are great little little pinches that you can – of these little little doses of these things that you can get a disproportionate bang for your buck. And a hip flexor stretch. Mm. Probably stretch your hip flexors. You should definitely. Okay, yeah. So all right. a static hip flexor stretch is pretty invaluable. So thoracic. So it's thoracic. If for mobility you do thoracic, for stretching you do hip flexor, for activation you do deep system, and then for a primal movement you do squat. Yeah. Yeah. And that's – you've 80 20 um, Correctives cor- <laughs> with air quotes. <laughs> without, without wasting more than about, you know. Three minutes. Yeah. yeah. Not, not a lot of time spent. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't have to be your whole work. You don't have to have a corrective stay or a corrective section. You just, you know, mm. incorporate it into your warm-up, make your warm-up movement strategically correcting things that you have tendencies towards. So mm. I have a tendency towards a sore back, so I do a little bit extra multifidus stuff. I do mm. a lot of sitting, so I do some thoracic work. Mm. Um, hit Dorsey if I'm doing a squat day. I don't hit it if I'm not doing a squat day. Like I, I mix it up. So mm. it's, you don't have to hit everything every day. If I'm doing bench, I'll do some extra rotator cuff stuff. Yeah. But if I'm not benching probably leave it alone. And the, exactly. rose, the rose will hit it enough on that day anyway. Exactly. And uh, it's not mutually exclusive with getting a good sweat on and pushing hard. Like you can do that stuff and that enables you to then lift harder. Like that's the thing is if you're doing, if you're doing that stuff well, it actually enables you to smash your training because you're going to feel great. You're going to have great quicker. alignment. You'll recover quicker yeah. uh, and you go harder and you get a good sweat on. Uh, that's, I mean, it's, if you're training and you're never – there are some people that are training and never sweating. It's like, well, you're not really training. You're just kind of – it's activity. 
I like to call them move sessions. Move sessions? Are you, are you training today, No, I'm just moving. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just moving. Just getting blood flow, so I fluid through the joints. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, hopefully that's some good takeaways. Certainly some good links. Uh, yeah, a links. whole bunch of links, which will be in the show notes, uh, which will go up shortly. Um, I think that's it, isn't it? It's really mm. just... It's just a, it's all about not being dogmatic and mm. just like coming into your arguments from a position of curiosity. Well, curiosity. Why, why do logic. you feel that way differently to me? What do I have to learn from you, person with different context, different mm. populations that you're working with, and yeah. maybe different experiences? And yeah. you might not. You might like this isn't to say it, it always that you no. you learn something every single time you do that, but more often than not, you go, oh, I still disagree with that, but that was a valuable lesson. And, and what I learned out of this was I, I was probably inadequately fo- – prior to watching this argument, I was probably inadequately focused on the negativity of nocebo. I hadn't really thought about it deeply. Mm. So that was a great learning. But it was if I'd just fired up on the ask gravy comment. And, you know. So kindness. I think kindness and curiosity are going to feel much more productive discussions. You'll learn more. You'll learn it faster. People will be more willing to help you too. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Nice one. Uh, Yeah, I think that's it. That's it. Plenty of show notes. Enjoy. (laughs) And we'll see you next time. See you guys. And before you go, hear from our alumni about the online mentorship. I learnt the theory stuff at uni, but I didn't know how to apply it. And coming to Core Advantage was how I I bridged that gap. So I I knew the stuff, but I didn't know how to do the stuff. It was something that I needed to do personally for my own development. And it's allowed me to work in elite sport for now five years. It was a massive help. I think mentorship is really important and being able to ask questions all the time and the Core Advantage course allows that because there is a big team of people that you can ask questions. I get to, um, you know, train professional athletes every week, um, work really closely with professional athletes, which is awesome. A lot of the skills that I'm applying, uh, I learned through the program at Core Advantage. It's not just something that you read and then think about and then go, oh, how, how does that tie into everything? It's, it's something that you, practical that you can turn around and go, this is exactly how I'm going to apply it. Um, and the concepts that you learn help you as a, as a coach, as a professional, as a person. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Definitely go and do it. Semester three of the mentorship is now open. Apply at coreadvantage.training mentorship.